warm welcome and to everyone who has joined us today. And I know Cassie has started our recording. If there's anyone who wasn't able to join us live or if you've joined us live and you want to see this again, this will be recorded and archived. So again, we're just thrilled to have you. Um, if I could have my slides up pretty please. And you can continue to let us know where you're joining us from and um, what your weather's like in the chat box. All right, so this is our sixth education webinar. We now are having both education webinars and citizen science webinars, and everybody is more than welcome and encouraged to join both of these. There's not really a, a strong separation between them. Um, the information and the presenters whom we have uh, sometimes will differ, but again, just feel free whenever your schedule permits, whether you're an educator or a citizen scientist or both, to, to join us for any and all of our webinars. Next slide, please. So today we've got some really neat things happening. We're going to see who had, has made our honor roll for the past month. We'd like to see your name on this honor roll soon. I'm gonna learn about the Smithsonian Mosquito Curriculum directly from somebody who's been intimately involved in working with that curriculum as well as some other curricula as well. Then Dr. Lowe is going to take us through a live demonstration for how to identify mosquito larvae. And in addition to that, she's going to tell us how these data that we are collecting are going to be used to assist scientists and public health officials. And we're gonna finish up by shining our spotlight on Columbia where one of our fabulous GLOBE teachers has, has been doing some really neat work. Next slide, please. So this is for the past 30 days. And what I did was I took the top people who have been on our honor roll with the most um, mosquito habitat observations, which they reported, um, and they had to make the honor roll four times uh, during the month and have the most uh, observations submitted. So we have, as you will see, a lot of people, over half of this honor roll are people in Senegal. So a huge shout out to our friends in Senegal who are doing such a great job to document and reduce the number of potential mosquito habitats that we have there. We've also got um, folks in Thailand. Two of our 10 are from Thailand. We see that we've got the Philippines, Colombia. We have our own Peter Nelson who's been collecting lots of data as well. So let's, let's have a little bit of healthy competition here and uh, get yourself on our honor roll. I do update the honor roll every week. I look at the past uh, seven days and I update that in our discussion forum of our Globe Mission Mosquito page. And then I put those together and come up with a monthly honor roll. Um, so a huge shout out and thank you for helping to reduce the threat of mosquito-borne diseases around the globe. Next slide, please. Um, as of yesterday, we have had a, a, the total number, I'm looking back to, uh, I believe, it's a little hard to see there, it's 2017, uh, I think it is 522, so May 22nd of 2017 to yesterday, we have had a total of 3,772 sites, and at those sites, we have had a total of 10,495 observations. Every month I'll continue to update this slide with the latest information. So let's keep those observations coming in. Uh, this is just a, a huge help. And, and as I said, Dr. Lowe will be showing us in a little, in a little while, or telling us about how these data are, are going to be shared with and used by both scientists and public health officials. Next slide, please. So through this mission campaign, I always like to go over this quickly. This is basically a campaign that's connecting citizen scientists of all ages. Our second graders are every bit as important as our senior citizens who have retired and are out there helping us to collect this data. We're really interested in finding out about the frequency, the range, and the distribution of these potential disease vector mosquitoes. And another click. So you're helping us to conduct research to explore how these conditions vary. Um, I mean, how, how these things vary, how, much mosquito, how many mosquitoes we find and when they're active and which types of mosquitoes, how do these vary based on these weather and climate and, and environmental conditions that we consider? And one more click. This is a really neat fusion of the formal globe, which used to simply involve 
educators, but not just simply all over the world, and our Globe Observer programs, which are available to anyone who gets a little bit of training in using the app. Next slide, please. So there's four basic steps. They're super easy. You don't have to do all of them. The first one is to identify the potential mosquito breeding habitats. You find places where there's standing water and you take pictures. What could be easier? The next one is to do a sample and count. If you find that you happen to have some larva, maybe some pupa, perhaps a few eggs in there, hopefully not a live mosquito, but you never know during active mosquito season, then you perform a count of about how many larvae you see. Photographing and identifying is what Dr. Lowe is going to be presenting to us today and showing us how to do it. Super easy and pretty fascinating as well, and the larva cannot hurt you. Then finally, the other step is to eliminate breeding sites. And that, of course, you can do all during the year. You'll find these potential breeding sites, and then you dump out the water when you can and eliminate the breeding site. Next slide, please. Throughout this campaign, we have three basic science questions we would like to focus on. We want to identify a baseline over the next three years for the range and distribution for such vectors as Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. We want to identify the seasonality of these local mosquito vectors. When is your first sighting? When is your last sighting? When do you seem to have the greatest number of observations? And we're looking to quantify the change in mosquito frequency and distribution at your local level, at regional levels, national levels, and finally global levels, and compare and contrast that with the environmental parameters which we know impact these mosquitoes, which are things like precipitation, land cover, surface temperature, and soil moisture. Next slide. So our guest speaker today, our first guest speaker, is Andre Radloff, he's a curriculum director at the Smithsonian Science Education Center. He leads the development of the Smithsonian Science for Global Goals project. He has developed curriculum and professional development for the Virginia Public Schools, George Mason University, as well as the Jason Project at the National Geographic. Um, the thing that he mentioned that he did that really prepared him the most, though, was teaching science and math at the secondary school level. So it's my great pleasure to pass the baton now on to Andre. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dorian. And uh, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to uh, listen and learn about our project here. We've uh, been graciously greatly working with uh, the GLOBE project for the last uh, two years now, I guess, uh, when I first met Rusty. And uh, it's been a really cool to see how we can blend our projects together um, to sort of work together since we're all working towards the same goals. So I'm gonna talk about our project um, as a whole, and then I'll talk about how this mosquito project is just one of the modules inside of a larger project that we're working on, just so people are aware. Um, so the project is called Smith Science for, Science for Global Goals, and um, we develop, we don't call it curriculum, we call them community research guides. So these are guides that you could use in a variety of uh, situations. It doesn't just have to be a classroom. It can be formal education or it can be informal education. Um, you can use them to just do research in your community. Um, so if you wouldn't mind clicking to the next slide. Cool. Um, just to give you an overview of the project as a whole, um, the, this project is based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, so it uses that framework when thinking about and making decisions for what the modules should look like and how they should function. Um, they are developed to be region agnostic, grade level agnostic. We kind of shoot for an age range of between 8 and 17, 18. Um, that's the age range that we've used these with so far. Um, but the, the function is that it's not specifically designed for a specific region. It's meant to be very agnostic, and then you, you, you apply it to wherever you are. Um, then we field tested in different places around the world. Um, so we're working with teachers in Indonesia and Australia and Africa um, and throughout the U.S., um, we are then trying to provide them in multiple languages um, as they're getting completed. And all of these materials are free. 
That's the, that's the thing. So it's built on this idea of equal access to quality education. Um, so everything that I'm going to talk about here today for the next 10, 15 minutes is all free. And I'll, and I'll tell you at the end where to get access to it. Uh, if you want to mind clicking to the next slide. Cool. Um, just a few more things about it. The concept of these modules is, is it's supposed to provide a guide and support to do firsthand research on a problem. In this case, for our first module, which was about mosquitoes, it was to provide you support to do research on that topic in your community from a variety of perspectives. Um, so part seven, we engage kids in uh, science explorations, and that's, this is where the Globe Observer comes in. So we build in the citizen science projects, such as Globe Observer, into our project at the point of use. Um, so I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The other part of this is that we uh, engage students or learners, uh, youth, and the problem from a variety of different perspectives. So they're gonna look at it from a very sciencey, environmental perspective, but they're gonna, they're gonna learn about the social or ethical or economic parts of that problem and think about how those elements of their community might play into how they would deal with this problem. Uh, then we try and develop a rich storyline that brings people through, uh, it brings them through a progression. And really the function of that progression is to get them from defining the nature of the problem where they live. So if you live in Senegal, what is the nature of the problem there? And then by the end, what sort of actions should you take based on your understanding of how the problem is defined in that location? And hopefully by the end, you know, this is just fun that you're learning about your community and you're enjoying that. Cool, can we go to the next slide? Cool, and this is uh, just some very high level background. The concept here is that as the as the, the users move through the experience, they're exposed to these problems which are global. So when we talk about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, those are global issues. Then we bring it down to very hyper local investigations, local decisions, local actions, which then hopefully in the end impact these global issues at a higher level. So that's sort of this global local connections that we're trying to foster that through this whole experience. Cool, would you mind going to the next slide? And this is just more background on the project as a whole, but hopefully it sort of shows you the progression of all of these modules, whether you're studying mosquitoes or I'm gonna talk about our other module that's about food later. Um, whether it doesn't matter which one you're going through, you're going through this learning progression. You're understanding and exploring your, your, your cultural context where you live, you're engaging in questions, you're exploring the problem through investigations. That's traditionally where science education has lived on that bottom half of the pyramid. Then the top half of the pyramid is traditionally where social studies education or civics education has lived. And what we're doing here in these modules is that we're bringing those two fields together into a uniform experience. And so the, stu the, the users will move through this experience, going from questioning, investigating, synthesizing, to figuring out what they should do, what sort of actions they should take. And this is a cyclical progression. So just if you want more background on that or want to read more about that, I will provide links to all of that. But I just want to give a basic background on that. If you wouldn't mind switching to the next slide. Cool, so this was our first module that we built using this progression. So this module is a guide to walk you and anyone you wanna do this with through that progression. Um, and so as you can see, it's a community research guide. So would you mind going to the next slide? So when we developed the storyline for this particular module, and this is where Globe, this is where I met Rusty and you know, Teresa and other, and other folks and Lee from USDA, um, when, we, when we at Smithsonian are building these modules, we go and work with the experts in those fields to say, well, what should the storyline look like? So these are all the different organizations that we worked with um, when we were building out and trying to figure out well, what should people be researching in their local community as they go through this experience? And these are the folks that helped us do that. Would you mind going to the next slide? Cool, and then what ended, ends up happening is that the people that we work with at each of those places, such as GLOBE or say Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit, is those people become part of the story. So the users of the, the guide learn from those people. So they're learning about people who work in that field. We're getting stories from them. 
they're telling us how they think about this problem, and then they become part of the story. And then those become resources to help people. So say you talk to Mira, who works at USAID, she's gonna think about the problem from a very different perspective than say Kelly, who's a biologist, who's studying the problem from a very scientific perspective. You mind slip and switching to the next slide? Cool. So, they, so these folks and these institutions helped us map this storyline out for this guide. So if you're, as you're walking through it, these are the, the guide is broken down into seven parts. And so in part one, you're just, you're sort of understanding what's the nature of the global problem. Then that's where we're starting big. Then in part two, we're moving down to hyper local. What does our community think about that problem? This is the very anthropological. Go and survey people, ask them what they think. Are they concerned? You're doing very social science research there. Then part three, let's look at the life cycle. What mosquitoes live here? You're getting more into the environmental stuff. And then part four, how does these diseases get transmitted locally? And then part five, habitats, which is where um, actually part three and five are where Globe Observer is going to come in. I'm going to talk more about that. But part five, let's really explore what are the habitats for um, these, you know, these mosquitoes in our local space. And let's, we're researching that in the local community. Then part six moves into, okay, what are all the different ways you can manage mosquitoes? What are all the options? And just so that people can understand what are all the options on the table? Then part seven goes back to the, to the students saying, okay, well, what do the students or the users think we should do in our community? What sort of actions should we take on this? Cool. So that's sort of the, the storyline. And I'm going to flip um, to the next slide, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm going to focus in now on one of those seven parts. Like I said, the modules broke, broken into seven parts. Part five, each part is broken down then into a series of tasks. And so we're trying to make this very user friendly for you, hopefully. And in part five, there are five tasks that you need to do. And this is where we've really baked in uh, a lot of the Globe Observer resources into this, these tasks. So task one, you're gonna be using the bingo game from Globe Observer to just understand you know, what are all the different habitats that exist. Then 5.2, now you're actually gonna go out and identify and map the habitats using the app and using the resources from Globe Observer. Um, in addition, you can do some local vegetation surveys and then you're gonna look at some community surveys on whether people in the community are aware and have an understanding of where those habitats are. Cool, let's go to the next slide. So this is where, you know, we have, our modules at Smithsonian are much, I would, they're large sets of curriculum. And then what we do is we build in resources like Globe Observer into the module. And so like I just mentioned, um, the, the Habitat uh, Mapper app is built into task 5.2. So as you're going through the module, when you get to 5.2, we will tell you, okay, now is the time to use that particular resource. Okay. And you can see I mentioned the Zika Zap Bingo game in 5.1. So those are the types of things um, that, that exist. Um, let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Sorry, I got a few. Um, like I mentioned before, the researchers are built right into the module. So we have all, a whole literacy series for, to, to practice reading. And this is where these researchers that I mentioned before, such as Rusty, who we're going to you know, hear from later, Rusty is built into the module and Rusty shares her stories of who she is, how she got interested in what she's doing. She describes the work that she does, um, why it's important to be doing all this. And these are literacy pieces. Yeah, I think someone has a, someone has a question, it looks like. Um, cool. Is there a question? Okay, cool. I will go on until we, we see it, but, um, but just so you know that these are sort of, these are literacy pieces for people to practice reading and within the context. And so that's all built into the resources. Uh, would you uh, mind switching to the next slide? Cool. So that's our, our mosquito module and I'll, sh I'll, I'll put a link up here of where you can access that and get more information on the project. So that's currently available in English and Spanish and we're working on other languages in the future. Um, these are the future tentative topics as part of the larger project, so you're aware. 
Um, we're currently working on a project on food, and then we're doing one on water, and, and these are the different topics for the future. Um, I'm going to switch into the next slide. Cool. Um, and just so you're aware, this is currently the project we're working on right now. It's in development, but you can see um, this is the storyline for the food module. So it's, it's a community research guide, and you can start to see the similarities here. Um, same thing, the students will now be defining the nature of the food problem in their community. They will then go and do research on food in their local community, you know, looking at where their access points are, looking at cooking and all sorts of um, issues around that. And then in the end, same thing. Once they've had a chance to sort of define what is the nature of the food problems in our community, what sort of actions could we take to address those? And so the reason I, I bring that up is, I want, can you switch to the next slide? Oh, it's I didn't, uh, I'm gonna put that here. Oh, here it is. Uh, actually, uh, go for you, yeah, perfect, perfect, sorry. Um, the reason I bring up that food module is because we're currently field testing that. And what field testing is, is we ask uh, educators or facilitators um, to try out the draft versions of the, of the module and give us feedback on how they go so that we can refine them. And I just wanted to make people aware if they were interested as that is happening right now through July. If you were an educator that was interested in trying that out or getting access to that to try out any parts of it, feel free to email me at that email and we can get you access to that project. Um, but more importantly for right now for this group is that that website there is where you can access the entire Mosquito module for free um, and you can use any parts of it, do whatever you want with it, tear it apart and customize it to work for you. Hopefully we've modularized it in a way and these parts and tasks that you can get down to just the, if you just need a couple tasks here and there, feel free to do that. But uh, just wanted to make you aware of all that. And so I think I've taken um, enough of your time, but uh, thank you for taking the time to, to hear about our project. And if you wanna learn more, um, you can go to that website just to get more background or feel free to email me um, if you'd like more information about the project, how to use it or have any questions about it. So cool. Great, Andre, um, I'm, I'm, I just read that Vicki, who's on the call, made a comment that kind of relates to something we talked about um, a couple months ago, which is, he, she has said, it'd be great if the Smithsonian could do modules and include the Earth observing satellites and data and show yes. how that connects with the kinds of things you've been talking about with respect to food security, mosquito disease, and so on. So um, yes. that's just kind of, um, um, something cool for us to see that people like this idea that we've been thinking about. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, Rusty and I have been talking about that, how, how to build other parts of Global Observer into, we have a list of currently 20 future <laughs> topics. <laughs> Obviously, we can only do them at a certain pace right now. Um, but yeah, like we have one that's all about, you know, land use and you know, food systems and agriculture. And so those are the modules as they get created in the future, we will be building in working with Globe to figure out where would, you know, all the different parts of Globe best fit, you know, into these different modules to talk about different topics. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, definitely that's, that's something we're going to continue to talk about. So we're excited to, to figure that out. <laughs> Hey, that's really good to hear. I work over at, at Goddard Space Flight Center, and I know, you know, a huge emphasis that we have right now, especially, well, with all of our missions, but especially our, our Earth observing missions, are to be really focusing on and emphasizing the applications. So yeah. that really is exciting. And that's where, you know, we, we love that about the GLOBE program as well, is that we can bring to you, here is how you can collect data. Here's how this data is being collected at NASA. And, you know, here's where sometimes using both of these, you know, these different platforms from on the ground using GLOBE Observer and GLOBE and in the sky using the satellites, we can kind of fill in some of the gaps and, and work together. So really exciting. And Andre, thank you so very yeah. much. It yeah, is cool. cool to see these ones that are, you know, that are upcoming and uh, that, that you're going to be working on. I, I know from my perspective, having been a classroom teacher for many, many years, um, it's invaluable to have these resources. And particularly, as you were saying, when you're able to customize the resources to make them fit the situation that you're in. Yeah, exactly. That was, that's the hope, you know, 
that anyone can 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 do this in, in their own way. So uh, we and we're very excited and happy that we met, you know, and learned about this program because and that we can, you know, it's 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 so great on its own to be able to build that into what we're doing so that we can support each other. That's really really sort of the the function here. So super fantastic. Cool. Well, we'll we'll continue to work together. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move on to the next slides that I have. And then as there are questions, you feel free to put them in the chat, chat box. I saw that uh, uh, Tanmay is already chomping at the bit to start learning about the identification of mosquitoes. And we're gonna get to that, I promise you. I did wanna give a couple of tips, um, especially for those of us like myself, I, I live in the Washington DC metropolitan area. And right now, fortunately, even with this lovely weather, I haven't been getting bit by mosquitoes yet. However, um, I took a walk around my house on Saturday and Sunday just to try to look for where there was standing water because I know as the weather starts to get nicer and climatically, it's generally in about the end of April, beginning of May that we start to, in my area, see active mosquitoes. So I walked around the yard to see what could I find that could potentially have mosquitoes? And so um, over here is a little garden statue. I took a picture of that and I sent the information in. When I looked at the water that was collected in her little dress here, fortunately there was no mosquitoes, but I went ahead and I tipped her out and I emptied her because that's a good practice for me to get into. When it rains, she's gonna have water there, nice for the birds to come and drink, but on a weekly basis, now that the weather's getting warmer, I need to empty that water to ensure that I'm not accidentally encouraging mosquitoes to breed. I also found the sandbox for my granddaughter that had been, that sand had been emptied, it had been left outside over the winter, and there was tons of water in, in both the top and the bottom of that. Again, didn't find any active mosquitoes, but I turned it over, emptied it, and I put the top on. So now, even when it rains, there's no more um, potential there. This is a Christmas tree stand that uh, was left outside my house down near the basement. However, it does get a lot of water in because there up above it is a deck and the rain comes through the deck. Lots of water was in there. Again, no active mosquitoes, but I poured it out. Now over here, my friends, this I made on purpose. This is my mosquito trap. And last webinar, we showed how to make these. Um, you can look at our website and I'll be sharing in the chat box uh, where, where you can go to find this information, but how to make your own mosquito trap. With my mosquito trap, I checked it. I didn't have any mosquito larvae yet, but I didn't empty the water because like I say, there I'm purposely trying to get mosquitoes interested. But I have a little net um, that you'll learn how to put on the, on, on inside it. And that way the mosquitoes can get in and lay their eggs, but they can't get out. Next slide, please. And another thing that I wanted to um, show folks is that when you are taking your data with your, with your app, um, as when you finish taking your data, um, you're gonna see something that says, send observations now. Sometimes people are collecting data when they don't have access to the internet. That's just fine. The really good thing is with the Globe Observer, you can collect data, take your pictures, collect your data, even when you don't have inter internet access, and then later you can send your observations. The thing though, um, is that you need to remember to send in those observations. So let's say you didn't send them in right away. Maybe you wanted to go ahead and do another observation and you didn't want to have your phone tied up with uh, sending the observation. In. So you can skip that. Then you um, can wait until you're finished with your observations, you have internet access, then you're gonna come down to where it says review and send my mosquito observations. You're gonna go there and you're gonna click on the observations that you want to have sent in. Every now and then I do an observation just showing someone how to make one, but it's not one that I wanna keep and send in, so then I could put it in the trash. So just to let you know, don't worry. Sometimes if you're taking an observation and you put something that you didn't mean to, you have a chance to erase it before you send it in. But then let's say I go ahead and I click and I say, okay, I'm ready to send it in. And then I get a little success message saying, yes, you did it. You sent your data in. So just the, make sure that you are remembering not only to take your observations, but also to submit your data. 
that is uh, super important. And next slide, please. All right, I think we have two poll questions. Oh, beautiful, this is a poll question. So here you're gonna answer this. Have you ever tried to identify mosquito larvae using the mosquito habitat mapper? Just go ahead and answer yes or no. And then we're going to be able to see how many people have tried it. Um, Cassie, for this, they just go ahead and click on the screen, is that correct? So to, to answer this poll, you don't do it in the, yeah, that, apparently the screen doesn't click. Um, trying something new here. What you'd have to do is you'd have to go to that website, www.menti. Uh, maybe we could put it in the chat window, www.menti.com. All right, so if you, whoops, go to www.menti.com. If you go to that website, then you can, and uh, so we're finding that most of the people who are on have not yet had the opportunity to try to identify the larva using the app. Okay, we have one more question. Go ahead and stop that poll and go to the next question. Then I wanted to get a feel. We call in education we call this dip sticking. So trying to find out before we have our presenter, trying to find out what are some of the reasons why you haven't um, had a chance to do this because that will help Rusty when she's presenting to kind of front load her presentation and make sure she touches on these. So when you go to that code, you will have um, a couple of different options to choose from to let us know what has gotten in your way of, uh, of you know, uh, and why haven't you used this yet if you haven't. And I'm gonna go ahead and try this myself. That's pretty cool. No, that's neat. Never I love all these answers. This is great. I love the word, word cloud. Yeah, really cool. And awareness, love that too. Yeah, and, and no time. Oh, I get that. But you know what I'm doing now? Just, just as one of those things that's helpful. When I go on a walk, I'm walking the dog, um, I take, you know, my phone with me and I have my app ready. Of course, uh, uh, not of course, I, I was on a walk yesterday and I was over at the, at the schoolyard and there were children playing. And I know that if it's private land or if it's something like a school, of course, at no time am I gonna take pictures and use anybody's faces. We always wanna uh, maintain confidentiality. But while the students were outside, I wanted to be sure also that I wasn't taking pictures. But when I went around and I saw a ditch that had water in it, that was a perfect place. It was on you know public property uh, to be able to collect data. So there's an idea for something that you might do. All right. Wonderful responses. Thank you folks for giving that a try. That's really neat. And Cassie, thanks for always being, being willing to try something new. So now without further ado, uh, actually there might be one more slide. Ah, and without further ado, it is my pleasure to uh, ask Dr. Rusty Lowe to take us through how we are able to identify these mosquito larvae. And remember that the larvae themselves cannot hurt you. So uh, there, you, you will be safe and she'll give you a couple of precautions um, uh, when you are identifying your larva. All right, Dr. Lowe. Okay, great. I'm going to share my screen now and uh, let me know if it shares properly. Do you see my friend here? Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Dorian, for inviting me to uh, speak at the session today with uh, Andre and um, it's great to be among friends here. Everyone here is on the webinar. And um, what I thought it would be fun today to do today, just for 10 minutes, is to look at a mos mosquito under the microscope because sometimes they look a lot different than what you anticipate. And sometimes they're hard to, to identify. Um, and so I thought it would be good to just run through this together. Um, what I'm using today is not the clip-on microscope that you may be using in your project. You might use something like this or something that's black. Um, this I'm, I'm using today is a, um, a digital scope. Um, it runs about 20 US dollars, uh, but it has very high magnification. And so I thought that would be a better thing to, to use um, in this uh, demonstration. So what you see here is the, um, 
the is the mosquito um, the, the head of a mosquito larva and um, <clears throat> because the magnification is so great I can't get the whole one on the mic uh, here too easily but I think it's important to go through and look at all the mosquito parts so I have um where's my little uh, okay here so can you see my pointer does that show up on the screen it does not or it does yes it does okay. on the head okay. Great. So here is, this is the mosquito head, uh, the, the head of the larva right here. And here you can see one of its um, eye spots. Uh, these are its antenna. And I have to um, apologize for the condition of my mosquito. I've had this in alcohol since the last mosquitoes in, in uh, Colorado in September. So it's really kind of a lousy specimen to look at. And we're not gonna be able to see all the features. But um, Dorian, if you'd like, I promise to come back with some, with some fresh specimens in just about a month and a half. So if you can wait that long, we can do that. But um, here's some things that it's really important to recognize because you know, you know that there are about 3,500 kinds of mosquitoes. And so we're trying to say, hey, do we have one of these four uh, taxa that you can identify using the apps? So it's a very small sample, but it's not quite as small as you think because um, some of those mosquitoes, there's like, for instance, crowd, um, crab hole mosquitoes, and you're never going to run into those. And there's a whole bunch of those. And there's mosquitoes that are found. Um, I was just talking to Leah on the, um, Leah on the, um, on the chat. You know, there's, there's mosquitoes that um, hatch out of snow pools. And, you know, so you may not be running into those mosquitoes necessarily, but um, there are a few things, features to look at just to make sure that you have one of the species or one of the taxa that we're interested in. The first thing to look at um, when you're doing this is to look at the head. And one of the things we want to make sure is that you're not looking at an imposter species. And an imposter might be something like a coronamid or some other kind of invertebrate that kind of looks like a mosquito but isn't. And if you follow the steps in your app, and if you have your app open, you can do that right now. Um, you'll be able to identify what are the what makes it a mosquito mosquito, and the most important thing is to look at the head, and if the head is um, broader than it is long, um, it's most likely a mosquito, that is and is potentially one of the mosquitoes that belongs to our group. So the second part here, this big fat part that you see right under the head, this is the thorax, the second part of the mosquito. And the thorax is always wider than the abdomen. And in a lot of the other invertebrates that kind of be imposters for mosquitoes, they don't have the wide head and they don't have the wide thorax, but they do have the segments because that's something mosquitoes have. So, um, and actually all, all in, these insects have. So anyway, so those are two things to look at. And then um, this is very sensitive. So I'm gonna try to get down here with, uh, I'm gonna lose it a few times, I think. I push this down to the bottom. Let's see if I can move this around here. Okay. This is like such a fantastic instrument. And if this was like a, you know, a $400 um, uh, microscope, I wouldn't have trouble finding things so easily because they're more precise. But my gosh, the, the, the kind of um, resolution that we have with this little $20, um, with the little ones that we use, it's just amazing. Okay, so here we're down at the bottom. And what you'll know about the abdomen is that there are, um, 12, um, there are a bunch of sections of the abdomen. As you move down, two sections of the abdomen have been modified. And so you have uh, these two features that we'll see. And these are the things that we're going to be looking at when we're trying to determine what kind of species we have. So what we see on up here is this is um, on this part of the ab abdomen, you have something called a saddle. And it is this sort of thickened part right here that goes around the abdomen. And um, in order to determine whether or not it is, for instance, a culex or an adis, one of the things that's important to recognize is where these little hairs come out. 
and this is called the ventral brush, if you're interested. Um, in um, the Aedes mosquitoes that we're looking for and the Culex mosquitoes we're looking for, this brush is always at the bottom of the saddle and it, it does not pierce it or penetrate it. Because if, it, if, if these hairs are found up here somewhere, we know it's not one of those species. And don't worry about trying to remember this because these, these are all things that are in the app and you just answer the questions as you go. But the most important feature that we're gonna be looking at today is the, is this, is the um, siphon. And it's right here like this. And one of the questions that your app asks you is, do you have an, a siphon that is pointed or is it rounded like um, a spool of thread or a spindle, or is it long and thin? And then you answer that question and that will take you to another place in the key. So if you look at this, at this um, siphon here, would you say that this is um, pointed or would you say that it's, it's long, very long and thin, or would you say it's sort of short and stubby? So if you'd like to put your answers into the, um, into the chat, I think that would be interesting to just to hear your guesses. And uh, yeah, I, I would say looking at this, and I have to say, if you're not sure, you know, it's a lot easier with your fresh specimen. And so let's do this again, Dory, and when we have, when we have good fresh specimens in your, in your bucket at home, right? Uh, but the, yeah, this is a long and a thin specimen um, on, the, on, the, um, on the siphon. And so uh, we are going to see whether or not this might be a Culex. And yes, yeah, some people are already saying that. <laughs> Inez, Inez uh, who's one of our friends in, our, in um, Brazil, she has seen so many of these, she's able to guess right away. Um, so yeah, this is actually a Culex. Um, you can tell because um, if you, if I take a little, um, this is my little um, pointer here and I can move it around just a little bit and see if I can see. Um, it's hard to see, but on the edges of this specimen, you have something called um, pectin. And you can think of that as being little tiny, little tiny um, uh, barbs, you know, like you might have like in a comb. And so uh, that's how we know that this is, that this is the specimen. Um, even if you can't really see those all that well, uh, sometimes you might have something like up here, these, these, these hairs. If you see those down here at the base, you know it's not Culex. And all those things are in your key, so it's very easy to find. So what I thought I would do, I've got another couple minutes, and what I thought I would do is I would just show you um, um, some slides that show you what these, what, what we're looking at because it was hard to see and I didn't look at these specimens. I haven't looked at them and they look really good two months ago. They have deteriorated since then. But this is what we just looked at. So think about that specimen we just saw. Here's that head, the head which is almost always wider than long, always wider and long for the specimens that, for the taxa that we're looking for. You have the abdomen. Remember that abdomen was kind of crushed on my specimen I was showing you, but it's always fat. It's larger than the head. And then you have the abdominal specimens, um, the, the uh, parts right here. There is the siphon, which is what they breathe through here. And this is the tail segment where you have what we call a saddle, which is a thickened area here. And um, moving forward, there. So there's the... See, so you, have, you have these um, 10 segments here. And one of the, the ninth segment is modified into a siphon. And see, we did not see it very well in my terrible specimen I showed you, but if you see these little tiny um, barbs here, that is what we call the pectin. So we can just go through, and, and this is basically, every time you see a mosquito, try and have this idea in your head um, there's a picture of this right in your app so you can refer to it and see if you can see the things that you see and see if it responds to this. Pretty amazing how you can just, you know, see such, with, with, with such accuracy, uh, such resolution using a, a, a $20 lens. Carry on. It, 
It's absolutely fantastic. It is better than the lens I used in my master's thesis, let me tell you. <clears throat> um, you may find Anopheles. Um, Anopheles is the only genus of all those mosquitoes I talked about, those 3,500 mosquitoes. Um, those that are Anopheles are the only ones that don't have a breathing tube. And that's because where you see these little arrows, they have places where they breathe. They are palmate structures, and they're, 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 they're places where they're able to bring in the air by laying across the water. So if you don't, if you have a head, if you have the wide thorax, and you don't have the siphon, you have an Anopheles. I'm just running close to my end of time here, but I wanted to point out what it looks like in, I think one of the things we need to do, we always are always iterating and trying to improve this app. One of the things it says is, is it pointed? And some people might have looked at that siphon and said, yeah, it's kind of pointed. But when we mean pointed, we mean sharp, because there are two genus of mosquitoes that um, do not cause disease, and so they're one of the other species you might find in the app. They have a really sharp point, and that's because they take that, that little sharp point and they pierce the plant, and they are actually able to breathe through the roots of the, um, between, between, um, breathe through the root structures of those aquatic plants. So um, I just thought that was important to show that to you because some people get confused. Oh, it kind of looks like it's pointed, but we mean pointed, we mean sharp. Okay, I wanna just go back and um, show you two more features and then we're going to close for today and I think we'll need to come back and do this again. Um, but uh, you'll see here on the, on, this, on the number eight part of the abdomen, you have these things called comb scales. And this is a picture of an Adi's mosquitoes. And um, this one here, can you see how it's not, instead of being long and thin, it's kind of shorter and sort of fatter. And this is what we call a spindle shape. Now, no one, has, no one does uh, spins wool anymore, so they don't know what a spindle shape is, but it's just basically shorter and fatter. And so this is what your, your 80s mosquito is going to look like. And then to determine bet between whether or not you have IADs, um, albopictus or vexans, which is very common. Dorian, that's probably what you found when you were looking and it was not one of our species, uh, or albopictus or uh, aegypti. It's the number of, of these, it's the number of rows of these you have and what the shape is. So um, I can tell from this drawing, they kind of look like pitchforks. And if it looks like um, pitchforks, it's gonna be an 80s um, aegypti. So um, these are all things that are in the app, but I thought it would be really interesting and fun to just show you some of these things and talk through them because um, when you have a specimen, you're trying to do it really fast and you might not have time. Um, I really apologize for the specimens I had to show you today, but um, that is just about all I wanted to tell you. Uh, but here's something that's very exciting. And Dorian was saying that one thing she wanted me to do today is talk about how this data can be used by different, um, um, different scientists. And I think that that might be a whole discussion that we need another whole webinar for. But what I would like to do today is um, to invite you to a new initiative that we are developing with the Globe Mission Mosquito Mission. I've been in contact with one of the scientists at um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA JPL. Um, her name is... Um, Erica. Uh, yeah, her name is Erica Podest. I'm sorry, I was thinking Andre. I don't know, I, I messed up. But uh, Erica is like a fabulous scientist. And she is very, she has actually done some research looking at the problem of dengue and um, how um, satellite imagery can be used to um, identify where dengue is found. And so she is very interested in working with a couple of, of um, other uh, scientists there this summer and looking at the Globe Mission Mosquito data. Now, one of the problems we have, as you know, you guys are the first ones to ever use this app. You know, we don't have tons of data yet. So for them to do the kind of analyses that they want to do in order to be able to look at the data in the context of perhaps satellite imagery, we need lots of data in one place. And I know that some of our friends on this call from Senegal, I know Colombia, Thailand, um, India, there are, and of course Brazil and Peru, um, there are some places where there's lots of data coming in. And if you are interested in being identified as a Globe Mission Mosquito 
a science research team at your school, if you'll let me know, um, I'm, we want to identify three or four or maybe five teams that would be willing to uh, continue to collect data um, over the next several months, um, including setting up a few um, traps and looking at them every week, as well as doing the measurements by walking around and finding the uh, sites. So this is a very exciting activity. Um, it's so new, we don't even have any press on it because I just talked to her a few days ago. Um, but I know that um, Dorian will be working closely with me, with Cassie, and with Dr. Podest um, in, in trying to get some really analyzable, uh, these are pilot studies. You know, these are pilot studies. And we'd love to do a pilot study in your region if you think you can commit to making that many um, observations. So I think that at this point, we're just about done, Dorian. Um, there's lots more to talk about, but I want to thank all of you for your, in, your interest today. And um, as you know, I'm always here. And if you have a mosquito and you don't know what it looks like and you're not sure with looking at the app, you know, just go ahead and email me a picture. I would love to see it and I can tell you what I know. So thanks again for your, your interest today and um, have a great, great couple of weeks. We'll see you in a month. Thank you so much, Rusty. Really, really appreciate it. We have a few more slides, a little bit more information, and then we'll let you go. I always like to finish up by shining a spotlight on, uh, you know, anyone who's interested. I put a couple of links up there. Um, you'll see one of the links says teacher participation form. So, you know, if you would like to share some of the ways in which you're using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, either in a citizen science capacity or as a GLOBE teacher, we would love to shine the spotlight on you, partly to just celebrate the cool things that you're doing, but also it, uh, to, you know, um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. By seeing the different ways in which people are using this, this tool in their communities, it really helps us to visualize how we might be using it. So this is um, one of the people, um, Erquinio, Torbado, who has, he's from um, Barranquilla, Colombia. Uh, hopefully I pronounced those okay. Um, uh, in, in any case, he is somebody who has been on our honor roll time and time and time again. So I'm always reaching out to our honor roll people and saying, hey, I see that you're collecting all this data, you're contributing it. Um, we'd really like to learn more about your work. So so um, he was kind enough to send me some information and some uh, photo permission forms, because we never will use photos if we don't have uh, written and signed permission forms, telling us what he's doing and how he's using this with his students. Next slide, please. So he has a really unique uh, situation. He is working in, in an area that is endemic for many of the diseases that are transmitted by, uh, by mosquitoes, such as dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. He works in a program where the students are from disadvantaged populations. Many of them have suffered conflict and they are now living in apartments that have been donated by the government. So what he does is he engages them in authentic science activities and includes their parents in, in helping out with these. And he has worked with the GLOBE program for over 12 years, just a, a phenomenal champion for the, the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. So he taught the students how to identify potential breeding habitats. He also um, shared with them some ways in which they could be collecting samples of the mosquito larva that they were seeing in their homes and around their environments. So one of the things that I thought was very fascinating and important was that there were many different types of potential breeding habitats that they were finding, lots of different water sources. Many were natural, but many of them are artificial they found a lot of these within the home. So containers that, that parents were having, keeping plants in, um, ornamental plants and that sort of thing. One of the reasons that's so important is the kinds of mosquitoes that we're looking at uh, that, that can transmit uh, some of these diseases. Many of them are container breeders and we are gonna find them inside our houses. So it's really important that now they don't have to get rid of all their plants, but they just have to ensure that they're emptying the water on at least a weekly basis. 
Also, they have um, water collection ponds because they have periods when they have a lot of precipitation and other periods when there's not very much. So that was another place in which they're finding that this water is collected. Now, of course, in some of those places, they're not going to be able to empty the water. What they can do is if they're noting that there are a lot of mosquito larvae in some of these sources, they can alert the public health officials in their area to be aware of that because generally, especially when you do have endemic vector-borne diseases, the public health officials want to be aware of that and want to be making sure that they're spraying or doing whatever the protection is that they do in their area to try to ensure that they're reducing the, the mosquitoes that, that can breed there. Next slide, please. So here are some of the containers that his students were, were collecting um, from their homes and then putting the tops on and bringing them in. And of course, the putting the tops on is important because they don't want to spill it on the school bus. And they also, in case the larvae have gotten to pupa and then have gotten to their adult form, they don't want to let them loose. So they went ahead and they brought in their samples. Next slide, please. And here they are working with uh, Mr. Torbado and they're identifying the kind of larva. Here he, you can see that he's got his cell phone set up and they've set up just kind of a, a way, you can make this an engineering challenge for those of you who are always looking for ways to incorporate STEM in your classroom. Have students work on taking their iPad or their cell phone and finding a way to kind of keep it with the cell phone magnifier so that it's at a, at a perfect distance above the larva so that they're able to look at it. So you see them there working with their larva. Next slide, please. And these are some of the fantastic pictures that they were able to take using their cell phone and their optical adapter. And here we can see those pectin that, that uh, Rusty was talking to us about. If you can see where my pointer is coming over here now, we can all identify that these indeed are pectin. And were we able to kind of, thank you, manipulate um, and up a little bit, and maybe the middle sample shows them better. If we were able to manipulate this uh, larva so that we could go right over those pectin, we would be able to see what the shape is. And we can kind of look here and see that there's only one row of them. So really, really neat work that they're doing. Next slide, please. Um, they're also collecting lots of data on their larva. So far they have 274 larva and 50% of these were um, classified as Aedes aegypti. They also found another species that we don't, well, they say that, that, that they have there, but that is not one of our vector mosquitoes. They also found Culex, Aegis, and Aegis albopictus. Um, none of the, the ones that they found were Aegis anopheles, or were anopheles. And next slide, please. Here we have one of the students presenting the results of their data to some of the other students. And next slide, please. So we continue to look forward to hearing more about the, the uh, research that these students are doing. And during our next webinar, we're going to be hearing from a couple of different student groups, and they'll be sharing the results of the research that they did over this past year using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper that they submitted to the International Virtual Science Symposium. We would like to invite everybody to join the buzz. And what we mean by that is that for this week through Saturday, we have a special event called the Mosquito Blitz. So uh, go to the link that I've put up there that tells you about the Mosquito Blitz. Share that with your, with your friends, family, closest associates, um, and get everybody out there collecting some of, this, uh, some of this data. And there's even prizes. Next slide, please. And we'd like to invite you to come back and join us in, uh, in later in April and in early May. April 17th, we're going to have our citizen science webinar and we're gonna be focusing on seeing your data. So you've been collecting this data. Now, how can you visualize it? How can you see it? And then our education webinar on May 8th will focus on protection and prevention. And like I said, we're also gonna be hearing from a couple of student groups sharing um, the results of their IVSS projects that they submitted to the GLOBE program. And with that, uh, oh yes, we have a couple more and these are some of the links that I've shared with you. Get on our newsletter and mailing list. So that way we'll make sure that you get our monthly newsletter, which will be released around April 17th. We try to release it the middle of the month. Make sure you visit 
our Globe Mission Mosquito webpage, check out our archived and upcoming webinars, and be sure to try out the app and submit your data. Super important. We will be having more blitzes over the year. We'll also have these, uh, these things we call IOPs or intensive observing periods. So stay tuned. One of the really cool things that, that now will happen with our app is when there is some sort of a um, observing period or a blitz, then that will come up on the app the first time you go, you've updated and you go to use it. And so you'll know what kind of the, the newest and coolest uh, things that we have going on will be. Yes, we are going to be having webinars throughout the summer. And I'm hoping that some people will, will listen to this and think, you know, this would be a fabulous way to run a summer camp. We could just, you know, we could use this app, we, or this tool um, with the app and some of the other tools. What a great way to get kids, uh, you know, engaged in informal settings. So things like summer camp, library programs, um, just all kinds of ways in which you could get people in your in your environment they don't have to be students uh, you know involved in helping us reduce the threat of the world's most dangerous animal which happens to be the darned mosquito so with that i will thank everyone for coming and um, we will stay on for a few more minutes and see if there's any questions it was just delightful to have people from all over the world joining us and a huge thanks again andre to you for for joining us and working with us we hope that you'll come back and join us again uh, yeah. Now that you see all the cool stuff that we're up to and all the folks that we have from all over the world who come and play with us.